Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Carol Werner. I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. And we are happy to welcome you to this briefing this morning and to also have as a partner for this briefing the Governor's Biofuels Coalition. So our to the topic before us this morning is future fuels. Can biofuels make gasoline cleaner and cheaper? This morning we are going to hear from four experts from our national laboratories who have been uh, doing research in this whole area looking at fuels, uh, looking at combinations of fuels, looking at life cycle greenhouse emissions, looking at fuel performance, uh, looking at the overall efficiency of fuels, the efficiency of engines, and how those things all come together which all can become quite complex. I think as any of us who start to read uh, materials, background articles, journal articles in terms of any of these areas. And so we think that this is a very timely topic uh, and an important issue to bring before uh, all of you, whether you are in congressional, in congressional offices federal agencies or in the overall policy community because clearly we need to really expand our understanding of what does make sense and what do we know with regard to fuels which are a very important piece of obviously our whole transportation sector. It's what makes our transportation sector run as we all know and the transport sector is still a very, very major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. And all of this becomes a very, very important area to really closely look at as this country and countries around the world look at how they are going to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions as the countries of the world all make commitments to each other as we move forward in the international climate negotiations. So uh, I want to introduce our speakers this morning. Uh, they will be providing uh, a unified presentation, and therefore I will introduce all of them at the same time. First we will hear from Dr. Robert McCormick, who is the principal engineer with the Fuels Performance Group at NREL, the National Renewable Energy Lab. Dr. McCormick is the platform leader for fuels performance at NREL, and the group that he leads at NREL is focused um, on biofuel utilization, particularly looking at fuel properties, fuel quality standards, fuel engine interactions, and fuel effects on air pollution emissions. He will be followed by Brian West, who is the Deputy Director for Fuels, Engines, and Emissions Research Center at Oak Ridge National Lab. And he uh, has been supporting uh, Department of Energy Research for more than 25 years on vehicle fuel economy, alternative and advanced fuels, engines, and emissions control technologies. Then, Callie Johnson, Transportation Market Analyst with the National Renewable Energy Lab. And in Callie's role as a Transportation Market Analyst, he is assessing the economics of advanced fuel and transportation technologies in various applications, locations, and policy environments. And our final speaker before we open it up for discussion with all of you is Dr. Michael Wang, who is the Senior Scientist for Energy Systems at Argonne National Laboratory. Dr. Wang leads the Systems Assessment Group at Argonne, and he is the original GREET LCA or life cycle analysis model developer, and he has been continuing to lead this very, very important great model development at Argonne, and he has been analyzing biofuel greenhouse gas effects for 20 years, and Michael is very much the go-to guy with regard to greenhouse gas emissions and life cycle analysis with regard to uh, biofuels and fuels overall. Uh, I also want to mention that we are hopeful that Congresswoman Tammy Duckworth will be joining us. If she is able to get here, uh, she will be coming um, towards the latter end of the briefing. So whenever she 
does arrive, we will just stop right then and so that she can speak to us and, and then resume. So at this time, I want to now turn to Dr. McCormick to start us off, because as you can see, when you just hear what all of these people are covering, that there are so many issues that are all intertwined, and it's important to get for all of us to have a better understanding, to get a better handle on this and what this really means for, for all of us. Bob? Well, thank you very much, Carol. <clears throat> and thank you all for coming today. It's uh, <clears throat> great to have this opportunity to talk to you about our work on high octane fuels, especially high octane fuels that are mid-level ethanol blends and how they can be leveraged to design more efficient engines. Um, this, this work that we'll talk about today has been a collaboration of three U.S. Department of Energy laboratories, so it's a pretty big, complex effort. Um, today we'll have, uh, I'll give a, a brief overview of what is octane number, what is engine knock, why you might want to care about those things, uh, ethanols, high octane properties, and also I'll talk a little bit about uh, mid-level ethanol blends compatibility with refueling infrastructure. Uh, Brian West will go over uh, high octane fuels and their benefits both in flex fuel vehicles and in dedicated optimized uh, vehicles. Callie Johnson will then talk about uh, the hurdles to introduction of high octane fuels and also introduction of new vehicles. And we'll talk about uh, our simulations of vehicle adoption and uh, biofuel production uh, supply train um, uh, simulations as well. And then uh, Michael Wong, of course, will talk about greenhouse gas emission impacts. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about is really introductory information that sets the stage for what my colleagues here will talk about. Um, as uh, <clears throat> all of you have probably purchased gasoline before, and you've seen these, these yellow numbers on the gas pump, I imagine, the pump octane number. And uh, this number is actually the average of two different octane numbers measured in a special engine just for measuring octane number under two different conditions that 80, more than 80 years ago when this was all developed were intended to span the complete range of engine operating conditions. Well, today engines have changed a lot and most experts in the field don't think this makes that much sense anymore. And it's really just one of those two octane numbers, the, the research octane number, or the RON, that really uh, predicts performance of fuels and engines. And for a high, uh, for a high octane fuel, um, many uh, folks in industry, as well as the national labs, think that it needs to have a, a research octane number of about 100, a RON of about 100. And that would translate into, uh, in today's pump octane, into a value of about 95. So I've talked a little about octane number and engine knock. Uh, the fuels today generally all have uh, a pump octane number of 87. The vehicles today are designed to operate on that fuel. But if you had a, a lower octane number for some reason, you'd experience what's called engine knock. And I want to try to take a second to try to explain what that is. So. In a spark ignited engine, a gasoline engine, the fuel and air are mixed together and then they're ignited with the spark plug. So uh, I'm not much of an engine expert, but I think even though you guys aren't engine experts, I think you can, you know that your engine has a spark plug. Uh, and then what happens is a flame essentially burns away from the spark plug and consumes the fuel and air, releasing a lot of heat, it gets really hot. But if uh, there's an area of unburned fuel and air before the flame front is complete. If it gets too hot and the fuel's octane number isn't high enough, it can auto ignite, which is essentially an explosion in the engine. Uh, this, can, this is engine knock, and this can damage the engine uh, pretty severely. Now, most of us have never experienced engine knock, but I would think that my grandparents, if I if they were still around and I asked them about engine knock, they would know exactly what I was talking about. Uh, but today we don't experience it because the fuels meet the minimum octane requirement, the cars are designed to run on it, and then the cars have uh, knock sensors and sophisticated controls that change the way the engine operates if they sense engine knock, long before the driver could even detect it. 
Um, but these changes that the, that the engine's computer makes to how it operates to avoid knock also reduce the fuel economy of the engine. So why, why would that be important to you? <laughs> if you're interested in uh, developing more efficient engines with reduced greenhouse gas emissions, um, there's a long list of strategies that you could, uh, you could go with, but here we list four of the most important Increasing compression ratio, downsizing and down speeding, slowing down the engine, um, and turbocharging. All of these are really important strategies for making the engine more efficient, but they also all increase the temperature and pressure inside the engine. So if you had a fuel with a higher uh, octane number because of the higher temperatures and pressures, you could use these strategies much more aggressively in your engine design to, to go after even higher fuel economy gains. The last uh, engine design strategy that we list there, direct injection, involves dr injecting the fuel directly into the cylinder uh, where when the fuel evaporates into the air, it cools everything down a few degrees. And this, this provides even more knock resistance. And uh, this is actually very important for ethanol. So ethanol has uh, some very unique properties as a fuel. It has a very high research octane number of 109, but it also has a very high heat of vaporization. So when the fuel evaporates in the engine, you get a much bigger cooling effect for a, a mid-level ethanol blend or a high ethanol fuel than you get for conventional gasoline. And this is actually worth... Uh, as much as two to three octane number units, this additional cooling that you get from ethanol. So it's, it's the octane number of ethanol plus the, the cooling. Another point we want to make about ethanol and octane numbers is on this, these blending curves here. When you blend uh, ethanol into gasoline at low levels, you get a pretty big, pretty big bang for your buck. You get a pretty big response. But as you get up towards E40, you get to a point of diminishing returns where you don't get quite as much octane for each unit of ethanol that you put in. Um, and also, ethanol has about two-thirds the energy content of gasoline, so you're, you're reducing the energy content and not really getting that much octane. So we've focused our work on E25 to E40 blends to try to stay in that range where you get a big octane effect. And then the, the E25 number actually has some benefits from an infrastructure compatibility perspective that I'll talk about uh, in a couple of minutes. So we have... Uh, uh, a need for more efficient engines. We can use high octane fuels to develop more efficient engines, and ethanol is a really great way to get to high octane fuels. That all sounds great, but we don't want to minimize the challenges to introducing a new fuel. It is very complicated to introduce a new fuel. Um, there's EPA uh, Clean Air Act requirements, safety and infrastructure requirements. Uh, the need to have uh, to demonstrate fuel engine compatibility and have fuel quality standards. And in the case of high octane fuels, actually to develop and market uh, optimized vehicles to take advantage of the octane number, uh, which leads to this last uh, constraint, the need to coordinate investments in vehicles by refineries and infrastructure. Uh, you know, nobody's going to build the cars if the fuel's not there. Uh, nobody's going to make the fuel if the cars aren't there to burn them. How do you overcome the chicken egg causality dilemma? <laughs> um, so there are some challenges, but there appear to be pretty substantial benefits, both in terms of vehicle efficiency, um, reduced greenhouse gas emissions in the, uh, the, uh, the tank to wheels uh, uh, area, and also the opportunity to put a lot more ethanol into the fuel market, uh, which is a low carbon fuel reducing greenhouse gases in, in that domain. Um, so the three national laboratories represented here have undertaken a scoping study to try to better define more quantitatively what the hurdles are, uh, propose resolution to those hurdles, and uh, quantify the benefits, uh, the potential benefits a little more directly, and uh, uh, recommend future R&D if it's, if it's warranted. So to kick that off, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, infrastructure compatibility. We've collected a fairly large amount of information about underground storage tanks over the past couple of years. 
And it's pretty apparent that the vast majority of underground storage tanks that have been manufactured and installed for the last several decades are compatible with any ethanol blend, E100. Uh, but not all of them, just the vast majority. And so the issue is that most of the, the fuel retailers are small businesses that only own one station. And they're not required to keep records of what they've got underground. And so most of them have no idea whether their tank is compatible. And in order to sell a blend over E10, they have to be able to conclusively demonstrate that their tank is the right tank to hold this fuel. Now that can be done. They need to bring in an exper experienced inspector to look at their system and figure it out. Probably cost them a couple thousand dollars. But that, that is one of the, the hurdles that would have to be overcome. The second hurdle is that E10, can, which is conventional gasoline dispensing equipment, is not gonna be compatible with these higher ethanol blends. But there is available a UL listed um, retrofit for these pumps to make them compatible with blends up to E25. It costs about $5,000. The um, so that's why we've picked E25 as a, one of the blend levels we're looking at because uh, the infrastructure barrier to introduction of that fuel appears to be a bit less than if you go higher where you have to purchase, the retailer would have to purchase an E85 pump which costs about $25,000, a much more significant investment for a small business. So with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague Brian West to talk about vehicles and uh, how they perform with high octane fuels. Good morning. Thanks, Bob and Carol. Appreciate the uh, invitation to be here. So I'm going to talk about some of the vehicle and engine work that's going on. Uh, we're, we're being funded by DOE to do a lot of this work, and we're working very closely with some of the auto manufacturers uh, who are providing hardware and, and even uh, funds in, in some cases. So Bob talked about downspeeding and downsizing. I'm going to try to explain to you a little bit uh, in a geeky way <laughs> what that is. Um, as Bob said, we can make more torque and power with a higher octane fuel, and, um, and ethanol, as he said, is very effective at boosting the octane number. So this graph I'm showing here, this is what we call an engine map, and on the uh, y-axis there is, it says indicated mean effective pressure. That's an engine geek number for torque from a single cylinder research engine. So, so think of the y-axis there as torque, and uh, the x-axis there is engine speed. If you've got a tachometer in your car, you know what engine speed is. That's, that's RPM, that's how fast the engine is turning. So what I've got here outlined in red is the engine map for this uh, Pontiac Solstice engine with its factory 9.2 to 1 compression ratio and 87 octane gasoline. It's a, it's a great engine and it, it does its job and, and that's the engine map you have. If we raise the compression ratio to 12 to 1, I get this smaller gray area here outlined in red now. So we've severely limited how much torque and power we can make by raising the compression ratio. We've made the engine more efficient, but we're just not making as much power. So this, is, this would be very troublesome to drive, and this is why the manufacturers, one reason they don't make optimized FFVs, they can take advantage of the octane of E85 because they still have to protect for the, the lowest available octane. So with 87 octane and 12 to 1 compression ratio, your engine is very limited. However, if we change the fuel to this high octane E30, so we take an 87 octane gasoline, add 30% ethanol, it boosts the RON to 101 in this case. Now we've doubled the available torque from this engine with the E30. And why that's important is lines of constant power look like this. So in today's engine, you can imagine you might be over here at, at 2,800 RPM cruising down the road, making the power you need to push your car down the road. And in the future engine, what we want to be able to do is slide up this curve to the left, and that's what we mean by down speeding. So if we, can, if we cut the speed in half, we have to double the torque. Well, obviously, in that little gray area, we couldn't double the torque. We can't go there. But we can go up here with the green fuel, and, um, and the reason that's important is because the best efficiency points on the engine map are up here in the upper left corner. So we want to live there as much as we can. That's where our fuel economy comes from. So that's what down speeding is about. Downsizing also would be, you know, because we've got this big engine map there, we can either put this engine in a larger vehicle, or we could make the engine smaller. So if we make the engine smaller, that's downsizing. We can make the engine smaller with this fuel with high compression ratio, 
and the consumer would buy a car that performs like today's car, but would have much better efficiency. So uh, increasing the torque with the, the fuel and the uh, high compression enables downspeeding and downsizing, gives you better fuel economy. This is for future vehicles, right? So we're going to talk a little bit about how we might get that fuel into the marketplace. Um, <clears throat> but what's exciting, Bob talked about the, uh, the energy density of ethanol. It's two-thirds of the energy density of gasoline. And uh, what's, what's exciting here is in the 25 to 40 percent range, we think the efficiency gains can overcome the uh, energy density loss. So you get the same fuel economy in this future vehicle with this fuel that you would get in today's cars, but producing less, less greenhouse gases. So every gallon of ethanol used in this way would displace a full gallon of gas. And I think that's, that's the really exciting thing about this. So let's talk about flex fuel vehicles for a second. Um, I think you're all familiar with flex fuel. They're cars that are designed to use any blend of gasoline from, from any blend of ethanol from zero to 85%. There's over 17 million of them on the road today. Um, unfortunately, they don't consume a lot of ethanol. They consumed less than 300 million gallons last year, which is about 13 gallons of E85 per vehicle per year. Uh, the reasons for that are, are numerous, but uh, one of them is the, uh, the tank mileage, the energy, because of the energy density and because the vehicles are not optimized for the fuel, um, they, they get lower fuel economy. So here's certification data from EPA for hundreds of flex fuel vehicles. This is the E85 fuel economy on the y-axis, and on the x we have the gasoline fuel economy. This is E0 gasoline, it's certification gas. But you can see they got about a 27% loss in MPG when you, when you run them on E85. And that's one reason I think consumers uh, shy away from it. If the price isn't right, then um, their, their cost per mile is actually higher. <clears throat> so consumer acceptance is key, of course. If we're going to have a new fuel in the marketplace and people don't buy it, then it's, it's not going to do us any good. So <clears throat> we did a small study to see if we could develop market pull. You know, what if we could get flex fuel owners to want this mid-level high octane blend, then they clamor for it, the retailers put it in, and then when the fuel is virtually everywhere, then the, the manufacturers can build dedicated cars for it, like I talked about on the previous slide. So what we did was we took four uh, late model flex fuel vehicles, and we did what we call a wide open throttle test. Um, I'm sure all the young people in the room have done this before. You, you step on the gas, you basically put the pedal all the way to the floor, and this would be representative of what you might do when you're trying to merge out here onto the, the beltway. So, um, and we, so we did that test with a, a 87 octane E10, and then we did the test with a 100 Ron E30. And what we found was that three of the four vehicles had a significant performance improvement. And this isn't about racing. This is about being able to safely merge onto the interstate, right? I mean, if you, if you have a little bit more power and you've got an extra 20 feet or so at the end of that on-ramp, that means you can safely merge into traffic instead of having to step on the brake and start over. So what's really exciting here is that with, with the E30 in one of the vehicles, we got the same performance improvement that was in the automotive press for a very similar vehicle with E85. And that just highlights this nonlinear octane blending that, that Bob mentioned earlier. So this is, um, this is important for two reasons. One is, you know, can we get the, the flex fuel owners to, to want the fuel so that they use the fuel that would move more ethanol? If half the FFVs used E30 half the time, we'd consume an extra half a billion gallons a year of ethanol. That's about 4% of what we use now. That'd be a significant increase. But better than that is that if you, once you establish this uh, wide range availability of the fuel, then the, the manufacturers can build cars that are designed to use it. So one more little uh, experiment we did. Uh, we had a Ford Fiesta EcoBoost in our lab recently. Uh, this is a, it's already has a downsized engine. You've probably heard of EcoBoost. This is the kind of engine that would certainly take advantage of a high octane fuel, and I'm going to demonstrate how that it does. Uh, this comes from the factory with a one liter, three cylinder, turbocharged gasoline direct injection engine. So those are all some of that alphabet soup that Bob talked about in his earlier slide about the kind of technologies that we would expect to see on these future vehicles. And we noticed in the owner's manual, it says you can use regular in this car, but for severe duty service, you'll get better performance with premium. And we also noticed that Ford authorizes the use of E15 in this car. So what we did was we, we blended 87 octane E0 with 15% ethanol. And what that did, and increased the RON, as you see, from, from 91 to 98. So a really big increase in the octane number. But it did... Uh, it did impact the, um, the energy density, as we would expect. It, it drops at about 5.5%. So if the car was not optimized at all 
for the fuel, you would expect a f about a 5% loss in miles per gallon, okay? So we ran it on these three different tests. One's called the city test, one's a highway test, and one's this real high load, aggressive uh, USO6 test, it's called. And what I've plotted here is the relative fuel economy. So the gray bar is the gasoline fuel economy divided by the gasoline fuel economy. So it's one. So all those gray bars go to one. The red line is this uh, 90, 94.5% energy density difference that we would expect. So we, sh we would expect the green bars to be down there at the red line. You can see they're all above that. Why? Because the engine's more efficient with this high octane E15. So much so that on this high load US06 test, we had a 4.5% efficiency improvement. So this is that volumetric fuel economy parity that we're talking about. And, and it's important to point out that E15 to E0, that energy density difference is the same as you'd see between E25 and E10. So E10 is ubiquitous across the country now. If we had a, a high octane E25, we believe that future vehicles could get the same fuel economy as today's cars. So in closing, um, to, to demonstrate that further, we have a dedicated vehicle project. I don't have any data to share with you. This is underway. I hope to have data uh, toward the end of the year. General Motors is supporting us here. We're in the process now of, of, of designing pistons to put in this Cadillac ATS. It's equipped with a two-liter turbocharged gasoline direct injection engine. Again, the kind of engine that can take advantage of, of this kind of fuel. So uh, I'll, I'll be real excited to be presenting these results um, in the coming months. And with that, I'll uh, yield the remainder of my time to the distinguished gentleman from Colorado. All right, so based on what Bob and Brian have said so far, this sounds like quite a promising fuel, but it doesn't do us much good unless we can get it out into the marketplace. So that's what I'm going to talk about. And so <clears throat> for our market assessment, uh, what we did was we, um, the overall purpose was to assess the feasibility, the economics, and the logistics of adopting high-octane fuels, which I'm going to use the unfortunate acronym of HOF for now. <laughs> I'm not just clearing my throat. Um, <clears throat> and so we want, to we want to see this feasibility from four perspectives, the four key stakeholder groups that need to adopt this. Uh, one of them is the, um, the fuel pro providers uh, that laser pointer isn't working, but on the far left, you have the fuel providers, both the biofuel and the gasoline providers. In the middle, you have the um, refueling stations, uh, the gear gas stations. Uh, you have the drivers who need to adopt it, and you also need the auto manufacturers that need to produce the vehicles. And so the strategy to check, um, <clears throat> to assess the market potential was to identify the benefits to each of these key participants because each one of them needs to benefit from it somehow in order to, in order to adopt it. We then went on to identify the hurdles of, of HOF adoption um, because, and so to do this, we did a literature search and we also did extensive interviews with representatives from these four uh, key stakeholders. We then proposed resolutions to the hurdles, and then we, we grouped a bunch of those resolutions together according to what were compatible with one another or even synergistic with, with each other, and came up with eight market scenarios for how this could be rolled out. Um, we then um, modeled the market scenarios in a couple of different models to, to test kind of what Bob was talking about, about the, the chicken or egg. Do you, get the, do you get the fuel out there or the vehicles out there first? And so that's what these models helped do. Uh, we ran it through the um, <clears throat> a vehicle adoption model, which helped us uh, find out under what conditions uh, the drivers are going to purchase these vehicles and how many of these vehicles they're going to purchase. And then we took those vehicle numbers and put them in a, in a fuel supply chain model to kind of see, you know, if, if there are these vehicles out there, how could the fuel be produced and supplied? So to start with the benefits that the different stakeholders would, would see, um, the, the, one of the primary benefits to the drivers are potential fuel savings. Um, so the, what this chart on the lower right-hand corner is, is if you look back, um, back in time, if, if E25 and E40 had been, had been blended from retail E85 and E10, um, these are the prices that it would have cost. And you can see that there are pretty um, decent price savings throughout the entire decade. And then EIA projects um, those price savings to continue into the future. 
And then, so not only is, not only is Hoff less expensive, but it also has reduced volatility, which volatility really kills a lot of business plans and hurts the economy. So you can see, uh, you can see that whenever, whenever uh, fuel prices spike, E10, which is what we're using now, spikes a lot harder and higher than E25 or E40. Um, another advantage for the, for the drivers is increased torque in performance applications. That's increased acceleration or increased towing capacity, which we all like. And then there are the energy security and environmental attributes. You know, you'll, you'll have to import less petroleum from the Middle East. Um, there's lower greenhouse gas emissions, lower criteria pollutants, um, things like that that a lot of the drivers appreciate. Um, and then the, veh the vehicle manufacturers also stand to benefit from, from Hoff. Um, <clears throat> uh, one of the benefits is the lower greenhouse gas emissions, you know, as they have um, pressure on them in various forms to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. This is going to help them to, to achieve that, that overall goal that um, is going to continue into the future. And then we have increased, they also benefit from the increased torque in performance applications. The fuel retailers benefit because Hoff could fetch higher margins. So, so a profit margin is the difference between what the fuel retailers pay at retail and what they sell it for. And, and the profit margins are notoriously low for gasoline because it's such it, because it's um, such a cost competitive market. Uh, what other what other product can you drive down the street or like on on your way to work see five different price signs saying, okay, you know, you can get the exact same product, or as far as most consumers know, the exact same product um, at five different places, you're just going to choose the one that is one penny less. Um, and so, so that's, that's a kind of a central conundrum of being a fuel retailer, is there's just not much they can do to increase their profit margins. But if they adopt Hoff, um, and they're the only they, at least at first, they're the only retailer um, within a certain area. They, they, can, they can eke out a higher profit margin, uh, potentially, because they, there isn't as much competition nearby. And then um, Hoff can also differentiate state, uh, stations in the uniform market. Um, uh, stations really, that, that's, one of their, that's one of the central ways that they try to compete with each other, is um, pointing out ways that they're different from one another in this very uniform market. And so if they adopt Hoff, uh, they, might, <clears throat> they might be seen as being kind of more technologically savvy or cutting edge, um, especially if it's kind of marketed as a performance fuel, um, and then people might, might prefer that station um, over the neighboring stations. And then uh, finally, the cheaper fuel could result in, in a, an estimated 3% increase in trips to the convenience store just based on the price elasticity and the, and the cost savings. And then the fuel producers could benefit uh, because it would help them comply with the renewable fuel standard. Um, it would help them achieve economies of scale for cellulosic ethanol, uh, which NREL has um, done some studies into the, how price competitive cellulosic ethanol is. And it's, 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 at a, it's really well positioned right now in terms of the technology being able to deliver price competitive ethanol. But we don't have the economies of scale to bring about that price competitive um, <clears throat> aspect. And so, um, and so Hoff could potentially bring a, upon those economies of scale to really bring the, uh, the price of, eth of cellulosic ethanol down. And then <clears throat> it could also enable, enable lower octane blend stocks, um, which, which are cheaper. And, and then um, one more is that it, it also enables um, it, it, an export market uh, for these fuel retailers if they're um, sending less of their petroleum and refinery products um, to, to the U.S. markets, they can, they can expand into international markets. So <clears throat> now that we've seen that like, all of the key parties could potentially benefit from Hoff, uh, we, we kind of dug into the hurdles and then the resolutions of adopting it. And so <clears throat> after a literature a review and interviewing the representatives from, from industry, we kind of came up with, with 30 central hurdles, which sounds like a lot, sounds kind of intimidating, but, but we also came up with 94 potential resolutions uh, that we identified, categorized, and discussed. Um, we, um, we categorized them according to 
according to how formidable they are and if they are showstoppers or not, if they're, if they're not p properly addressed. And so this table just shows like the first tier, uh, the first of four tiers. Um, and then we also, we also categorize them in cordi according to what type of hurdle they are. are they um, logistical, regulatory, behavioral, or economic. Um, and then we also kind of, um, we identified which of the stakeholders is going to be primarily impacted by, um, by the hurdle. So then when we had those 94 potential resolutions, uh, we grouped them into to eight market scenarios um, for ways that it could possibly be rolled out. And, and then we um, put it in our, our vehicle market adoption uh, simulator uh, to see if people would purchase these vehicles and under what conditions. And so what that chart on the left is, is um, that's the overall, the, the black line at the top is the overall total number of light duty vehicles in the US. And then the colored lines uh, that are rising are the, are the various scenarios of when people purchase the vehicles, how many of them, how many Hoff vehicle, vehicles are on the road as it increases over time. And you can see we, we started at, at 2018, which may not be realistic, but it's good to have it as, as close to possible because then the, the parameters in, in the model are, are more concrete. Um, and we started them all at the same time so you could compare them side by side uh, rather than having various delays. Um, and so I, I won't jump into that, um, into the spaghetti there where, um, where the different scenarios are increasing, uh, but I will point out some highlights, um, some lessons learned from the combination of the scenarios and, and contrast between the scenarios. Um, so overall, um, all the scenarios achieved a substantial percentage, that's between 43 and 79 percent of light duty vehicle stock uh, by 2035. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's a lot of vehicles out there. That, that's encouraging. Um, and then more of these vehicles are adopted if Hoff is E40 uh, because they offer the consumer greater fuel savings and they offer, they offer the vehicle manufacturer greater greenhouse gas benefits. And then you have a $2,500 purchase in incentive, which the incentives were one of the, one of the parameters that we tested out. And we found that a $2,500 purchase incentive boosted the 2035 uh, market penetration almost a third in the consumer de determined scenarios. And that consumer de determined scenarios uh, points out one parameter I want to point out to you guys is um, from the automaker's point of view, um, they, they could either determine the, the models, such as the Ford Fiesta, ahead of time and just convert them all over to um, <clears throat> convert them all over to Hoff ahead of time, or they could wait and see where the consumer demand was and then convert part of their model over ahead of time. Um, and so, so that brings us to our final, the final point um, where designating cert certain vehicle models to be converted. It leads to a higher adoption rate, um, but, but early adoption speed depends on the model production volumes. You know? So, so are, you, are you converting over the F-150, which has a lot of vehicles, or are you converting over a Porsche 911, which doesn't sell many vehicles? So we took those number of vehicles that are um, projected to be out being used in the marketplace, uh, put them in the model of our fuel supply chain, and the overall results uh, were pretty encouraging. The pre preliminary results show potential half consumption of up to 30 billion gallons of, of ethanol in 2035 under the scenario mo the scenarios modeled. And so um, to put, the, put that in, into perspective, um, this was, you know, the 30 billion gallons was a, um, it, that was 120 uh, billion gallons of, of fuel, which was about 60% of the overall fuel um, sold to light duty vehicles in, 20, um, in 2035. Uh, so we're talking, it, at least for that um, most successful scenario, we're talking pretty significant mar market penetration. And however, all scenarios um, are limited by one thing or the other. And so that's what I'm calling bottlenecks here. And so we, uh, through our, uh, simulator, we, we tested where are the bottlenecks. And so the foremost bottleneck was the fuel retailers investing in Hoff equipment, in the dispensers and underground storage tanks. Uh, that limited, that was the limiting factor in most scenarios. Unless they were incentivized to, to invest, um, unless the equipment cost is reduced, 
or if only compatible equipment is, is sold in advance. You know, if, 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 and what that means is that for years before Hoff was introduced, if when their equipment retired, they could only replace it with Hoff compatible equipment. Um, then when Hoff came around, it was pretty cheap for the refueling station owners to adopt it. Um, so for the scenarios where the investment uh, wasn't the constraining factor, um, the construction rate of new biorefineries bio um, limited the market um, because um, it, it, it takes a lot of resources to build a new biorefinery and ramp up. And so, um, and so for a number of scenarios, particularly before 2025, um, the, the biorefineries couldn't quite catch up to the potential demand. Um, and then for the scenarios, or after 2025, once they did catch up, then the limiting factor was half vehicle adoption, which is the number of vehicles out there on the road, um, as we talked about in the previous slide. And it's important to note that the feedstock availability, now this is um, a majority cellulosic ethanol, the feedstock availability and costs are not the limiting factors in any of the scenarios. And so that is the market assessment. Now I'm going to hand it over to Michael Wong to, Wong to talk about the uh, weld, weld the wheels analysis. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, so you're, of course, we all know one of the uh, motivations for biofuels in general and uh, the your tra new transportation fuels and uh, vehicle technologies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, of course, to introduce half with ethanol blood, uh, there are some uh, your debates about the potential trade-offs of the engine efficiency gain versus re potential refinery efficiency penalty. So overall, our well to wheels analysis address these potential trade-offs uh, to see if we indeed achieve a greenhouse gas benefit uh, by considering all the factors together. On the engine efficiency side, uh, Bob and uh, Brian already present the potential efficiency gas and why we uh, anticipate efficiency gas. Uh, in our analysis in this project, uh, the last line in uh, this table, this is the base of the team's uh, assessment of the technology and the testing results from Oak Ridge. Uh, we decide uh, in, uh, the, in our baseline analysis, we decide 5% efficiency gains are, are, are reasonable uh, you know, assumption to use. On the other hand, if we look at uh, the potential down speed, down, uh, downsize engine and other technologies together, we see the potential it can get to up to 10% efficiency gain. So we build the 10% as a sensitivity case together with uh, the 5% efficiency gain. And you see some other studies completed in the past uh, several years as their, their assessment of the potential vehicle efficiency gain. So your, our scope is uh, to put uh, the petroleum refinery changes together with uh, vehicle efficiency gains together to see the overall effect. So yeah, our, yeah, specifically, our well to wheels uh, task is our approach is to do detailed refinery modeling to see what type of changes we anticipate in refiners in order to produce half. Uh, we address two critical issues in our refinery modeling. One issue is Bob alluded to us, uh, how, do, how do we produce high octa fuels with refinery, with ethanol blend? At the same time, we do know we have uh, the uh, vapor pressure constraint you know, from the EPA regulation, so the RVP constraint uh, to be addressed uh, together with uh, the octa fuel production. And of course, how much fuel we produce would impact uh, the U.S. refinery industry. So Kelly presents the eight scenarios. So we base on Kelly's eight scenarios of the potential market penetration of half, of half 
Uh, the label is so, okay, if uh, the U.S. refinery industry to, pr to produce that amount of uh, half, what's the impact on the uh, refinery? And of course, uh, we uh, address the upstream crude production and ethanol production as well in our analysis. And uh, there, you know, we, I, you know, Bob, Brian, and myself already discussed the uh, vehicle efficiency again. So together, as you see in the chart, we cover from the feedstock production and the fuel production in refineries for petroleum, blend stock, and uh, ethanol production in our refineries, and they finally have combustion in vehicles. And uh, you know, in order to address uh, LP, uh, the uh, petroleum refineries, we use uh, the LP mo uh, model, the linear program model, to address this uh, specific uh, area. Uh, this is the type of uh, models used uh, by petroleum refiners for their optimization. So industry use LP for the refinery optimization on the annual basis to maximize their uh, profit or reduce their cost. So we use the same model as industry use. And of course, for LP modeling, you will have a set of input uh, the type of crude you bring in and the type of products you produce. So in our case, we specify the LP model to produce half gasoline together with many other petroleum products in U.S. refineries. And uh, here are some uh, sample results I uh, present to you and we have a very detailed report with all the detailed results. So on the left side of the, the uh, slide, this is the chart to show you the overall petroleum, uh, petroleum refinery efficiency. From uh, say um, your limited half penetration to very high half penetration up to uh, above 70 percent of the gasoline market is half. And the different ethanol blend level E10 to produce half OE25, OE40. Those are the three lines you barely see them they have your stack together. So the take home message from that chart is uh, the petroleum refinery efficiency change is very small to produce half. So we uh, anticipate a very small change in the refinery efficiency. And the right side is uh, when we uh, dissect uh, the overall petroleum refinery efficiency into gasoline efficiency. Because we have different products that we need to allocate to different products, the overall efficiency. So even when you see the gasoline efficiency changes, change is really small. So that's on the refinery side. On the other hand, uh, Kelly alluded to you the, the possibility to expand the U.S. gasoline export when you have increased the ethanol blend into the gasoline market. So here on the left side is the domestic gasoline production efficiency change. So again, you see a very small change in the domestic gasoline production. On the other hand, on the export gasoline market, and we do see some uh, somewhat significant change or your know, significant reduction in the export gasoline uh, efficiency. And in our world to wheels analysis, we did uh, include uh, the so-called spillover effect uh, from the domestic gasoline to the export gasoline. So this is included in our world to wheels analysis. And here is uh, the uh, result on uh, greenhouse gas emissions for the uh, gasoline blood stock. So you know, again, this is confirm uh, what you saw in the previous two slides, the uh, your small change in uh, petroleum refinery efficiency and in gasoline refinery efficiency. And this is greenhouse gas emissions in, in grams per megajoule of gasoline blending stock. So again, you see small changes among E10, half 
E25 half and E45 for both pad two and pad three. Of course, between two pads, you see somewhat increase in greenhouse gas emissions in pad two. That's the mid, uh, mid, uh, Midwest uh, refinery district, uh, primarily Chicago. At pad three is uh, the Gulf Coast uh, refinery district. And uh, the increase in pad two is due to our significant share of Canadian oil sand in the crude input in pad two refinery. So that's uh, the gasoline blend stock. So now when we produce the final half product, meaning the gasoline blend stock and the ethanol blend together, what is the result for each unit of fuel produced? So again, now you see E10 half, E25, and E40. So here, the baseline, the E10 Regular gasoline, that's baseline, that's the dot line, as you see in the chart. And so now you see a reduction for E25 half and E40 half. And this reduction is from the lower carbon characteristics of the ethanol part. So when we have core ethanol, we see some reduction. When we have cellulosic ethanol, as you see on the right side of the chart, we have significant reduction. So, so you know, the point is, on the gasoline blending stock side, we see a little change in carbon intensity. But when we bring gas, uh, ethanol into gasoline blend stock, we see reduction because of the lower carbon char characteristic of ethanol. And now we breathe efficiency onto the you know, uh, ethanol blend half. So you know, as I mentioned earlier, we have 5% efficiency assumption as our base case, and we have 10% efficiency as our sensitivity case. So when we breathe efficiency in, and we see your know, further reduction from uh, you know, the gas, uh, ethanol blend effect. So now the efficiency breathe for the reduction. So this is the PROMAR result for PROMAR efficiency now is a factor for the overall re result. So you know, now I'm going to use animation to re-emphasize what you saw in the last slide. So efficiency itself get us ourselves maybe 5% reduction in the best case assumption or about 9% reduction if we your anticipates 10% gain in efficiency. And that, uh, if we produce half uh, just in refineries itself, we see little effect uh, on the overall GHG emissions. But if we bring ethanol into the gasoline blood stock to, broad, uh, to produce half, uh, we see further reduction because uh, the ethanol blending effect uh, with lower carbon characteristics. And of course, uh, the differences between core ethanol and cellulosic ethanol, uh, as you see here. So your, your, this is a cellulosic ethanol and this is core ethanol. Uh, so the ethanol blending effect uh, and uh, the different ethanol types effect. So you know, in uh, conclusion, vehicle efficiency gains and ethanol blending are the two dominant factors for well to wheels GHG emission reduction of HAFA. And the impact of HAFA production on refinery GHG emissions is relatively small, as you saw in those charts. So you know, we you know, see ethanol can be a major enabler in produce half hour with significant vehicle efficiency gain and a large reduction in GHG uh, emissions. So that's you know, our world to wheels results to integrate uh, the other tasks together to uh, see you know, the overall world to wheels GHG result. Bob. Thank you. So just to very, very quickly summarize, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. Um, uh, we've shown that ethanol has very high octane number and, and excellent knock resistance properties and can be used to blend a, a highly knock resistant, high octane fuels, that these can be leveraged to design much more efficient engines. Um, our uh, 
bio our biofuel production supply chain simulations and vehicle adoption simulations suggest that uh, this could lead to 30 billion gallons of ethanol consumption in the 2035 time frame. And the well-to-wheel simulations show uh, for corn ethanol, uh, greenhouse gas emission duct reductions up to 18% and for cellulose-derived ethanol up to 31%. Uh, there are some hurdles to introdu introducing these new fuels and vehicles. Certainly on the infrastructure side, there are some issues that have to be dealt with. They are very solvable problems, but they need to be dealt with. And uh, to introduce a new, a new fuel and a new class of vehicles to operate on it requires some sort of market coordination in terms of investments in the different market sectors to make it happen. And so with that, I, I will... Uh, sit down and turn it over to Carol, I believe. Thank you all very, very much. And, um, and I think it was also really helpful to go through the basic um, summary slides to, to sort of pull it all back together again in terms of what all of this research really uh, helps us understand in terms of the whole role of biofuels and the role of ethanol in terms of providing a high performance fuel that can also provide, help ensure good fuel economy and, uh, and, and performance and also at the same time coming from a renewable resource that is going to help us substantially lower greenhouse gas emissions, all of which are very important factors as we think about uh, the way the way forward. So let's open it up for your questions and comments. And I should just mention that we are momentarily uh, expecting Congresswoman Duckworth to come. So go ahead. And if you could identify yourself, please. Bob Kozak, Advanced Biofuels USA. I first want to thank everybody on the panel. Really great presentation. I'm really glad this information is getting out. And I really applaud the work that you guys have been doing on this topic that isn't all that well known. Um, the one comment and I guess question I, I would I'd like to state is that I think that there is just simply one barrier to this happening, which is the lack of political will to make it happen. Uh, we know that uh, the e, the the E25, E30 was proposed in Tier 3 two years ago, and it was shot down by the administration. Not only was it shot down, but there were factors uh, as part of the CAFE standards, such as the R factor and the F factor, that could have been corrected properly to encourage the introduction of vehicles and fuels and infrastructure that weren't done. Uh, I'd also like to point out that we have switched fuels in the past. We went from Un, we went from leaded to non-leaded, and we okay. and we went to stage two. So uh, my question is, uh, do you think we, do you think we could, and how could we overcome the political hurdles? Okay, um, could we hold that question? And oh, okay, all right. Uh, go ahead. Do you want to go ahead and and answer, and then we'll turn to the congresswoman. Well, you've, in a sense, asked us a political and policy question when we're here to inform you about technical issues. Cer certainly, I, I, I think um, uh, all these things can be done. There's no reason why they can't be done, but um, I don't think we're going to be addressing the political or policy aspects of your question. Um, okay, and that's something that I, I think in terms of, of um, how to best deal with, as, as Bob said, there are a lot of things that policymakers need to address, and, but that we're not dealing with insolvable problems by a long stretch. So at this time, I am honored to turn to Congresswoman Tammy Duckworth, representing the 8th District of Illinois. Uh, she is in her second term here in the House of Representatives and has had a very distinguished career. I think everybody is probably familiar with, with her story. Uh, she is an Iraq veteran. She has served in the Veterans Administration as an Assistant Secretary. She uh, has 
and, and, and again, is in their second term here where she is making certainly a mark here in the House with her leadership in House Armed Services Committee, the uh, Oversight uh, Committee, and also on the Special uh, Benghazi Committee. And she has been a, a force, a very, very important voice on many different issues here in the House. And I think that also as a new mother, she is bringing yet another important perspective that is important for all policymakers to understand. And I want to mention also that with regard to all of the things that she has done, which has helped her understand how so many things come together and are, and are linked, just as what we've been hearing about this morning, that she has also spent time really looking at public health issues. And that is another aspect with regard to thinking about our transport sector and fuels that is very, very important and that we hope to do even more work on and working with her. Congressman Duckworth. Hello. <laughs> Glad I stood up. Um, thank you, Carol, for organizing this great event and for the panelists for coming to the Hill today um, to share your research on this incredibly important topic for our nation. Um, the scientists here today, including Dr. Wang from the Argonne National Laboratory in my home state of Illinois, are the real experts. But I'd like to take just a minute um, before they, we go further with the discussion to tell you why this issue is important to me as a layperson. Um, you know, as a veteran and a member of the House Armed Services Committee, I see renewable homegrown fuel as not only critical for our environment and our economy, which you've been hearing about today, but also as a national security imperative. Um, while serving in the Iraq war, I saw firsthand the painful price our country pays because of our dependence on foreign oil. My fellow troops risk life and limb for this precious battlefield resource. In fact, 50% um, uh, of all casualties in Iraq were as a result of convoy operations, and 80% of all convoy operations was to transport fuel. So that is literally thousands of young Americans' lives, as well as tens of thousands of wounded warriors. So I know that um, biofuels will help America become energy independent, but also it's going to make our military stronger and more effective as a result. A crucial piece of me being this goal is the renewable fuel standard, which as you know, is re a really hot debate right now in Congress. The RFS is poised to help end our country's dependence on foreign oil. Um, something Congress intended since the law's inception almost a decade ago. Production of biofuels at home, like the ethanol we make in my home state, means less foreign oil imports from unstable countries like Russia and Saudi Arabia. Um, instead of creating jobs in the Middle East, the RFS is driving job creation and innovation here at home, supporting over 852,000 green, well-paying jobs nationwide jobs that cannot be shipped overseas. For me, um, I've been driving an F-150 uh, flex fuel vehicle since 2006, um, and I, I understand the discussions that ethanol is not all that, as it currently is, is not all that great of an improvement, but frankly, it's American-grown corn, it's Amer made here in America, and I would rather spend my money, even if it's a wash, on um, a few that is made here in the United States, um, keeping American workers in jobs and, kelp and keeping their um, production capacity here in the U.S. than on foreign oil. So we're looking at about 852,000 green, well-paying jobs nationwide. Um, for this reason, I have been urging the administration to maintain a strong renewable fuel standard that will encourage continued growth of the American-made fuel market. And I know that my constituents agree that American investors and consumers at the gas pump are better off supporting American jobs and access to clean, secure American energy rather than Middle Eastern oil. Like many of my colleagues, I'm disappointed by the EPA's recent announcements on, announcement on the RFS. The new rule is an improvement over the last one, and I'm glad that it's getting back on track after many delays, but I'm still really concerned the proposed requirements are short of the levels Congress intended and short of what American farmers and businesses can produce. 
It's my strong belief that the development of biofuels will protect our environment and strengthen our economy and our nation's security. I will continue pushing for strong RFS as the rule is finalized. And you should know that this is not something that is um, debated just over in the energy and commerce subcommittees, but it's something that is really debated all throughout Congress. And armed services now, um, I've gone through three NDAs, which is the the building of the defense budget. And so far, every time there has been someone who will introduce a bill that actually would prohibit the United States Navy from developing biofuel capabilities. And to me, that is just the most ridiculous thing in the world. You know, the Navy has actually tried and, and successfully um, launched a training, a surface um, warfare training exercise in the Pacific using all biofuels for the ships, for the aircraft, for the everything, and, and has demonstrated that it is something that it is capable of doing. Um, and I really want to equate this to another precious resource, clean, drinkable water. Um, in the military, the Marines have what's called a rope U unit. This is a unit that can come in and generate its own water. They have their own osmosis um, system. And so what it, they do is, I was in Guyana on a humanitarian mission, and the, this Marine unit, rope U unit came in, stuck a hose into what was essentially sewage, and produce drinkable water for the unit on the other end so that we could continue to support the mission of building hospitals and schools and anti-humanitarian mission. These units increase the capacity and the capability of our United States military to be able to fight or, or serve in humanitarian missions on the go and be self-sustaining. Why can't we do that? with biofuels. Why don't we have that capability? You know, I served in Iraq on a base, the LSA Anaconda, Logistics Support Area Anaconda, that was huge, the largest base in, in theater. Um, and the amount of food scraps and the amount of waste that was generated on that base um, was significant. I would like to see the US military be able to have a biofuel equivalent of a rope U unit so that our military men and women can have access to those so that we can reduce this, the, rely, the reliance on um, uh, uh, petroleum products. And also, if we're using them to have a much higher standard um, uh, so that what we have to depend on will go a lot further in terms of mileage standards. And, and, and for me, it's all about keeping those troops out of those vehicles in convoys getting killed. This is a, not just a, an issue about economic security for this nation, incredibly important, but it's also about making sure we keep our military strong and capable um, and, and able to uh, respond and fight whenever the people of the United States ask it to. So I, when I have this discussion, um, I, I make a little bit of headway with my colleagues because I don't come from it as your traditional granola-eating, tree-hugger Democrat, which I am. But, but I can have the discussion with my colleagues on a much more tactical level about military security and military um, 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 readiness. And, and that has opened a few minds. So as you're continuing with this discussion today, think about other ways that you can frame the dialogue beyond um, um, the one that, that is a traditional one and one that we all embrace, which is its you know, environmental protection. But think about other ways that we can frame this. The economic um, strength one uh, argument is definitely uh, uh, an important one. But, but there are ways to, to reach out and find compromise on this. And, and so um, I, thank you for being here today. I want to uh, make sure that uh, you continue the work that you're doing. Um, and uh, I'll keep driving my F-150 until uh, we come up with something better. My other, I, I do have uh, actually a plug-in hybrid, so um, uh, we're, I'm all in on this, and, and let's make sure that um, uh, we continue to improve and we continue to hold the administration um, uh, to the goals that we have and not to back off from those goals. Because every time that we have set the goals, um, industry has met them. And, and so to say that the goals are too high um, is really to underestimate the capability of the United States manufacturing industry because I believe in American innovation and American know-how and to keep those goals high me only means that we will reach them and then we will have the edge on our competition globally. Thank you, everyone.
Um, it's my understanding that the Congresswoman's schedule does not permit her to stay for um, a Q&A. We'll have to go to the vote, so. uh, Which we totally understand, but we thank you so much for being here with us and, and for your remarks. And given the question, that was, you heard directly from a policymaker uh, with regard to uh, uh, where policy needs to go, but I think what's been so important in terms of the message that we've been hearing today is in terms of thinking about all of the issues around performance of fuels and the efficiency of fuels and what um, and what ethanol can provide and in terms of higher blends and also do it very economically. Other questions? Um, here first. Could you just wait for the mic? There you go. Uh, Bill Brandon, um, uh, in respect to what you were saying about refinery efficiency, uh, I understood you generally to be saying that that, that was somewhat governed by the uh, reed vapor pressure restraints. Uh, have you looked at the possibility of tri-blending with uh, a butanol that would uh, uh, give a more positive effect on that refinery end? No, we have not uh, looked at the butanol as uh, another renewable uh, uh, component to blend. This was uh, ethanol only, ethanol blend into a uh, gasoline component. Okay. Well, now, I'll just comment that, that we are aware of, of butanol's effect on vapor pressure, making it go down while ethanol in this blending range makes it go up, which, which is a problem for the gasoline blenders. So I, I think it's an interesting question in that uh, it, it might have some, some significant benefit. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, Doug Durante with Clean Fuels Development Coalition. This wasn't my question, but all of our, uh, and I, I do want to ask my question, but all of our work is not showing an increase per se of RVP, particularly if you splash blend these alcohols on top of the finished E10. So that's one of the problems we're having is you can't get any more fuel into the market because the RVP restriction is just codified as E10, which is simply because no one ever thought past that. So I, I just, I'm sure you guys have seen the same data, but that's a that's almost a myth that um, a lot of people on, on uh, are operating on that, that this increases and in fact it goes down you know uh, with volume but my question to you is you know, you've made a great case and I've seen your work and it's great stuff all of you if we don't get this octane from ethanol wh where's it going to come from you know we've got aromatic caps on toxics and these are toxic substances benzene toluene xylene so, so if it doesn't come from ethanol what, what are the options and secondly, don't, isn't, aren't we even more compelled if we move into tighter ozone standards and more of the country goes into ozone unattainment and has to adopt RFG, that definitely caps aromatics. So, I mean, we're really, we could be on a, on a real shortage of octane, and so doesn't this make it even more compelling what you're, what you're doing here? Uh -huh. Yeah, and, uh, we uh, did uh, restrict uh, aromatic contact uh, in our LP modeling to uh, meet the uh, DU, uh, EPA and uh, California's requirement. And without uh, ethanol blending, if we're going to make half, if we go with E10, we, uh, with the current uh, U.S. refinery configuration, we can only produce maybe up to 20 to 25 percent, half is the share of the gasoline market. So if we're going to go beyond that, that your ethanol will help tremendously. That's why you know, we say ethanol is a great enabler for half, significant half production. What, and, and some of the other, um, are you talking about restrictions, are you talking about alkalates or iso-octane, or are those, are those the other, I'm trying to remember what some of those other options are, but. Those are, and uh, you know, we have your know, reformate, of course, will continue to play a critical role for half production. And other component, some undesirable gasoline component for the U.S. gasoline requirement, uh, 
Basically, uh, we said yeah, those can get into the export market. That's why you see the uh, domestic gasoline versus uh, export gasoline. So some gets into there. Uh, with a uh, discount on price, so we did assume a, di uh, assume a discount price for export gasoline because some undesirable components add up in that market. Uh, we took that into account in our world-to-world analysis. So we have all the details in our LP modeling results, uh, which components increase, increased, uh, which components de decreased, uh, they all come here in our detailed report. And I think it's also true that the petroleum refiners are very highly optimized right now, and they don't really want to make more aromatics. So ethanol is, is in a lot of ways the, the best choice or maybe the only choice. Uh, it costs them something to make more, more aromatics. So aromatics are more expensive to produce. We also know that if the ozone standards are tightened, that's an issue because that's all connected again to aromatics. And that basically we've been dealing with the situation where the octane in fuels has been provided by uh, a petroleum derivative in terms of uh, the combination of, of um, chemicals in terms of, of aromatics, or you can get your aromatic, or you can get your octane um, from, uh, from ethanol. So that basically it's a renewable oct uh, uh, octane provider in terms of ethanol or um, uh, aromatics to provide the octane coming from oil products. So, and all of these things, as you were hearing, are totally related in terms of thinking about what happens if, if ozone is tightened as well. And it was very interesting in terms of knowing that the cost goes up for refineries to produce ever more aromatics. Okay, another question. Hi, uh, I'm Kevin Adler from Oil Price Information Service. And, and I, I think I'm directing these questions to Mr. Johnson, but certainly welcome anybody's. Uh, answer. The, the first is, I have two, and the first is just a simple thing. The, the 30 uh, billion gallons that you, that you referenced in the slides, is that in addition to, this is what, roughly 13, 14 billion gallons of ethanol use now, so is it incremental 30 or is it a total of 30? Uh, that's incremental. Um, well, it's, so it's the 30 billion gallons are all going into Hoff, um, and then Hoff does cut down the amount of E10 and therefore the amount of ethanol going into E10. You know, so it's, so it's incremental and then subtracts some out of, quite a bit out of E10. Okay, okay, thanks. Uh, and, the, and the second question, uh, and it, it goes back again to octane, uh, is my understanding is that uh, a lot of the uh, blending of E10 now is into uh, a gasoline with a lower, lower than 87 octane, that, that refiners are not using uh, the, the octane benefits to, to raise octane ab above 87. So in talking with them, are they even in interested in that or do they sort of look at it as this, this way to take this cheap, low octane uh, blend stock and, 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 and get to the minimums? Well, they're, they're, the refiner's business is all about you know, just meeting the minimum spec and making you know, a half a penny a gallon on an ocean load, ocean of, of product. So uh, yes, during the the last ten years, they've all reoptimized their systems, and they make what we call a suboctane blend stock for oxygenate blending, or suboctane bob that has about eighty four pump octane. And when you put the ten percent ethanol in it, it meets the eighty seven octane. Um, they don't have any incentive to do otherwise, regulatory or or financial. Um, and I don't see them doing anything differently unless you know there's a market demand for more premium gas or uh, uh, or for high octane fuel uh, or or some other some other reason why they would do do things differently. Okay. Hi, I'm Karen Pollard with um, Representative Denny Heck. Um, when we have to answer um, mail. Um, and we get mail on all sorts of things, but um, what mostly I heard was concern on for 
if, if the standards were raised, um, that the small engines, the folks that had small engines, would it, that would ruin their engines. Um, I think it was mostly motorcycles and snowmobiles. Um, can you speak to that? I, you know. Well, I don't think that necessarily is a high octane fuels issue. Um, the the small engines today should be compatible with 10% ethanol because it's but the only fuel available. So hopefully the the manufacturers of those engines have kept up with the times and made their their uh, engines available. Um, you know, I don't know if motorcycle manufacturers would like to design motorcycles to use this high octane fuel, uh, but as long as there are vehicles and engines around in significant number that could not use, you know, an E25 or E40 blend, then we'd have to find a mechanism to ensure that a, a compatible fuel was available. Because, um, the, the, you know, they're not going to be an E10 compatible uh, car or motorcycle or lawnmower or whatever is not going to be compatible with E25 or E40. And that's one of the hurdles that we looked into. And it's important to keep in mind that, um, that in order for a fuel to be considered convenient, essentially the cost of convenience is nothing, um, it only has to be offered in about 20% of the current um, refueling stations. You know, and so, so E10 or E0 will probably be around for quite a while. And then there's an increasing number of blender pumps also that could um, keep it available. And then I, I was talking to the National Association of Convenience Stores, you know, getting, getting their perspective on it. And, um, and, and they be, um, one idea that came from them was that, you know, Home Depot could offer E0 and marinas could offer E0. Um, that, you know, big home improvement stores like that kind of have the clout and the sophistication to be able to offer a fuel, you know, so they saw that as one possibility um, going well into the future, like if, if E0 did disappear from the other, um, the other stations. Uh, uh, can I add a comment? Sure, absolutely. Uh, just a comment, um, not everybody in here is old enough to remember when, <laughs> when diesel started to get popular in the 70s, but there were diesel vehicles being sold in the United States and uh, it was a hard fuel to find. And today, less than 5% of the light duty vehicles are diesel. <clears throat> the diesel fuel's everywhere. So we have, we have a fuel everywhere for a tiny piece of the fleet. And what we're talking about here, I think, is uh, hopefully a growing uh, size of the fleet. And as Callie said, if we can start with about 20% of the stations, it, would, it would, uh, could grow from there. But as Bob said, we need to maintain the legacy fuel for the legacy vehicles. <clears throat> Um, that's a really, really good point because I wanted to ask kind of a follow-up question on that too in that um, during, I think it was, Kelly, during your presentation you uh, commented about um, in terms of looking at sort of small businesses with, um, that didn't know what they had in their, you, you know, essentially in terms of looking at their, their tanks and the cost of, of their having, uh, updating infrastructure or anything like that, or maybe Bob, you, you raised this. Uh, and so I was curious though, in terms of the percentage of, of, um, installations that are really those kinds of situations as opposed to the uh, uh, much larger, like say convenience stores, chains, um, or whether it's your Target or Walmarts or you know, other, um, other facilities that offer a lot of pumps, a lot of fuels all over the country. So what are we looking at in terms of percentages? Or quantities. Um, so I had a pie chart on my slide about. Uh, uh, oh, maybe we, maybe <laughs> Amory can get it up for you. Slide. Oh, eight, good I idea. Think. Good idea. Next one. There you go. So, fifty-eight percent, fifty-nine percent are these single owner. Okay. stores 
there seems to be a trend that I'm reading about in this industry now towards consolidation and large, uh, not just uh, you know uh, Costco and 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 uh, Walmart, but other large, you know, more than than you know 24 pump type. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. type uh, of refueling businesses that own multiple stores, maybe even hundreds of stores. So maybe that'll change over the next decade, but today the situation is lots of small businesses. But if, if we're talking 20% availability, potentially that could all initially be in the, the in larger the large, stores right, that have exactly. more options, more capital to play with, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. are probably a lot more profitable. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's, there's yeah, better records, point. yes. Yeah, good point. There's a number of the most um, sophisticated convenience store chains um, that, I mean, so putting in a new tank is much, much cheaper if you do it when you're putting in the new station. Sure. You know, the incremental cost is pretty low. There's, there's a number of new of convenience store chains that are putting in extra tanks um, as they build stations just, just to be prepared for whatever they may, may need it for in the future. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Okay, last question. In the back there, okay. A follow-up question to this discussion. Did you do any calculations on the relative cost of uh, converting a station to E E25 or E30 uh, compared to how much it costs to convert a pump to stage two vapor recovery? Um, no, we don't. I don't have that information off the top of my head. It's a very interesting question. Any other last questions? Okay, uh, go ahead. Seems like to me you could have two. Tanks. Could you? Thank you. Uh, uh, Bill Brandon again. To a layman, it would seem like you could have two tanks. One would be your Bob tank, and the other one your ethanol tank, and then have a blender pump that could give you any blend that you want. Is there regulatory issues of who is certifying the fuel when you do that? Are they? Are they at this point? Are the Tank farms certifying the fuel or what? I, I think it would need to be an, a finished gasoline E10 tank and an ethanol tank. I, I'm not sure that the the, re, the retailers can actually be the blender of the finished gasoline. Um, I, and I think that's actually happening in some places. There is some concern with, I don't know how real it is, with uh, handling... Uh, denatured fuel ethanol not blended in gasoline because it, it the vapor pressure above it can be in the the flammable range under certain conditions and so that has to be handled appropriately um, there's some concern that not all retailers really know what they're doing with that uh, but I but I believe in some states uh, the, the state regulators and this is more from a safety perspective are allowing uh, basically what you describe with E10 and denatured fuel ethanol to be blended at blender pumps. Did you want to add anything, Brian? Uh, I don't know the, the numbers, but there are, you know, there's on the order of 3,000 stations that offer E85. Some number of those are blender pumps, and they already offer, you know, E0, E10, E15, E30, uh, maybe even E50, right, Dave? Um, so that's a, as Callie said, sometimes that's a that's a retail, retailer trying to distinguish themselves from their competition. But uh, so when I, you know, we did the the wide open throttle study with the flex fuel vehicles, you know, instead of the FFV owner pulling up and getting E10, wouldn't it be great if we could get them all to clamor for E30 and or E25 and 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 ask for that? And so uh, yeah, but I don't know the how many are blenders. Do you? We'll try to find out. Christy Moriarty would probably know, but she's not here. But we're happy to find that and make that information available to talk to Christy and get that information. Because I, th I think it's important in terms of looking at all these issues that it sounds to me like there are a lot of benefits moving forward and that that there are not insurmountable challenges by any stretch of the imagination. And then in terms of at least going to an E25 blend is should not be that difficult 
a situation in terms of looking at costs and existing infrastructure. Um, so that there are certainly opportunities and that it's also important, I think, in terms of thinking about um, how people get information and how many people are really aware of what is available where. And that probably retailers need to do a better job of that as, as well as, um, uh, you know, looking at, at automakers, et cetera, in terms of just getting uh, more information out to the public about what's available. Dave? Sure, just a comment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a defense that we can do that will facilitate this for the retailers and the automakers to move ahead with this, whether it's a cafe credits, whether it's a certification, etc. But there's a few simple things that they could do that would uh, facilitate this actually happening in the marketplace. Great. Well, then hopefully. People are going to be asking them to do that. Okay, great. I want to thank all of our speakers. I think that they probably are all very willing to take other questions and uh, provide information uh, going forward. Or if you want to give us the questions, we're happy to, to uh, get those to them. And I want to thank you all very, very much for your time and all of your research and for coming and talking to talking to us today. So we really, really appreciate it. Thank you all. Um, and, but before, before you all go, I just wanted to mention that uh, coming up, DOE is holding a major uh, bioenergy conference at the uh, convention center on the 22nd and the 23rd and 24th of this month. And on the 22nd, I believe that it is transportation day and it is available. So I hope you got the flyers outside. So I just wanted to make sure that you're aware of that and hopefully you will take advantage of it. Thank you. <laughs>